Don't you love it when you try to record a video and the long crews decide, hey, you know what? This one hour that he's got to record stuff, we're going to mow the whole neighborhood. Gotta love the suburbs. Let's talk some Dresden. There are things you can't walk away from. Not if you want to live with yourself afterward. It isn't good to hold on too hard to the past. You can spend your whole life looking back, not even when you can't see what lies ahead. All you can do is keep on keeping on and try to believe that tomorrow will be what it should be, even if it isn't what you expected. I'm dealing with a lot of scary things and I think you have to react to them. And you either laugh at them or you go insane. I am blinded and limited and I'd be a fool to think myself wise. And so not knowing what the universe means, I can only try to be responsible for the knowledge, the strength, and the time given to me. I must be true to my heart. So as it came charging towards me, several hundred pounds of angry looking monster, I did the only thing any reasonable wizard could have done. I turned around and ran like hell. Hey, what's up, Bookworms and Dresden fans? Mike here again to talk a little more Dresden Files, this time with the fifth adventure in the series, Death Mask by Jim Butcher. Now, guys, if you are with me at this point, you know that I have changed up the format and I am talking spoilers on these videos. Uh, I talked about why I was going to read the series, and then I did book one and two. I did non-spoiler, and I felt like that was my sales pitch for you to get in this series. When I'm on book five out of 16, uh, I feel like at this point you're either in or you are out and you don't need a sales job. So I have decided I am going to talk spoilers in this video. So this is your warning. We are going to be talking spoilers for the entire plot of Death Mask because up front, this book was freaking awesome. Uh, I loved it as, at, at the time. I said I still thought it was my second favorite, but now after I've had about a week to kind of let it digest, I think this is my favorite one so far. I really, really do. I was hanging on to Grave Peril, which I liked quite a bit. Summer Night didn't hit didn't hit the sweet spot for me quite like it seems to do with a lot of the fandom. But this one, man, this was awesome. This was everything I've wanted in the series since I picked up the first book. It's a fantastic read. And there, that is your non-spoiler review. It is so good. Uh, so now that you know how I feel about it before we get going, let's bust into that plot, right? So first we've got Harry on the Larry Fowler show because, well, why else does he do these kind of things? He needs the rent money, right? So uh, right off the bat, you're like, okay, this is a little a little different intro than I, I am used to. But, of course, all the equipment starts messing up because, you know, wizards and, 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 and technology, they just don't mix. They just don't mix. But uh, he's there to meet someone named Mortimer, Mortimer Lindquist. Now this guy is an ectomancer. And at this point... It's kind of like where I was at Buffy or Angel, where I just kind of stopped. Yeah, cool. You've got a cool title. It sounds like Necromancer. I just assume it's you're dealing with spirits or, or demons or some kind of magic. So I don't even know what an Ectomancer is. But that's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything. But he tells Harry he has tracked Susan to Peru, which is uh, you know where the Red Court of Vampires is set up. So you know she's still suffering from uh, not quite vampirism, but... She's just got to take one. She's just got to take one life, basically. She's just got to feed one time, and she's a full-on vampire. So Harry is still trying to find her. She's kind of fallen off the radar at this point. But there are other guests on the show. One is Father Vincent. He's a priest from the Vatican, and there's uh, what Paolo Ortega. Now this guy is a he. Obviously, he's he's masquerading as something else. Vampire masquerade. See what I did there? Uh, but uh, he is a Duke of the Red Court of Vampires, and he is there to tell Harry that he wants to challenge him to a duel to the death, you know, in, in place of uh, in place of a war between the White Council and the Red Court. He's like, hey, let's just do this one-on-one, -on -one, me and you. If you win, there won't be a war. If you die, there won't be a war, you know? So it's like this. We're just going to do this to settle things, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, kind of kind of ancient ancient uh, Greek kind of stuff here. Uh, there's actually a, a term for this, and I'm just, 
I draw a blank when I do these lives sometimes. Anyhow, so uh, Harry decides, yeah, I'll do it as long as it is a documented fight. It's in writing. There are rules and, and, and things like that. And uh, Ortega agrees. Uh, so we've already got set up for a death fight in the first chapter of this book. So I'm already, I'm already invested. I'm already in. But uh, he, he, Harry ends up leaving with uh, Father Vincent, another guest on the show, and he, t he tells Harry that he wants his help uh, to find uh, the Shroud of Turin, which, if you don't know, uh, this is allegedly the burial cloth for Jesus Christ. You know, I remember when this is actually on TV. They talk, he talks about it in the books, well, how they can't, they, they were never able to prove it. But I remember this, like when they were testing this thing way back when. I mean, I was like a ch young, like three or four, and they were actually testing this thing, and they said they couldn't find any evidence that it wasn't actually legitimate. So it's it's, it's kind of crazy. It's probably one of the most uh, historical items, relics, biblical relics that we have in the world, you know, because we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. We don't know if there's a Holy Grail. So I'm just saying, you get kind of off on one of these tangents. Now, look, when these stories go kind of biblical like this, I usually feel like they're hit or miss. This is really good. This isn't Dan Brown stuff here. This is really good. I'm really liking some of the things that they bring into this based off of religion. It doesn't feel this heavy-handed. It doesn't feel like a, a preachy kind of thing or even a, an agnostic kind of thing. So regardless of your feelings about religion or Christianity, I don't think that that's going to take away from your, uh, your, your, your feelings in this book. But when he's with Father Vincent uh, and he's asking for help, they're attacked by some of Johnny Marcone's men. So uh, Johnny Marcone is definitely not out of the series. Haven't seen him since Full Moon. But uh, he's definitely still been a looming presence, but hasn't actually showed up. And here he's got some of his goons coming after Harry. So I'm like, okay, cool. I want some more Johnny Marcone. Because I really thought that the interactions between him and Harry were actually my favorite parts of those early books. Uh, but they get away. Uh, that, that's when he tells them about the shroud. But Harry comes home, and Susan is there. Uh, she explains that the Red Court is split. You know, kind of half of them want this war. And half of them do not want this war. They would rather it just end with uh, with the fight with Ortega. So, um, yeah, she's not able to come in the house because he's put up like these wards or whatever. Obviously, it's protected now. So she's a uh, you know she's mostly more. I, I, at this point, I say she's more demon than human. So she's not able to come in uh, to to his home. But uh, Murphy calls and asks him to come to the morgue to look at a body because I mean that's what Murphy does. Hey, we got a death. I can't explain. Come check out this uh, gruesome, gruesome court corpse. And uh, this is where we meet Waldo Butters. Now this is an interesting fellow, uh, like a mortician body analysis kind of guy. Uh, he wears like bunny slippers and stuff. <laughs> and this is where I just think Butcher's just being quirky because he just creates some of these quirky characters. But uh, you know, this is one of those kind of characters that believes in all of the uh, supernatural elements out there and it kind of got demoted to graveyard shift which you know, ironically is when all the bad shit happens right so it actually makes a lot of sense i don't know if this is a recurring character or not i, I think it will be because uh, i feel like it's the kind that you need uh you need a little more allies in, in si for harry and uh, you know murphy's kind of on the outs back and forth with this so it, it it's i i got past the part I, i'm glad it got past the part where murphy was just always so antagonistic and trying to arrest harry i feel like they've actually got a real friendship now and i feel like she goes to bat for harry several times in this book i like i mean there's several times where there's something that she shouldn't be doing it's something that's actually putting her job in jeopardy and she still does it to back harry up so uh, i'm really respecting their friendship at this point uh, again, I'm not hoping for a romantic relationship between them or anything like that, but I like that there is a friendship. It feels real, you know? It doesn't feel forced, and it doesn't feel antagonistic at all. So I, I'm liking this quite a bit. She trusts them, that, that, and that's what I like. And uh, even though, you know, it's arguable <laughs> if she should or not. But uh, this body that they show him, you know, it's uh, it's missing its head and hands, so you can't identify it. And, but the weird thing is that, that Waldo tells him that it has like all these, it wasn't the mutilation. He says like cut the ribbons. It wasn't a mutilation that killed him. He died before that of like numerous diseases. You know, some of them even ones that we've been able to cure for centuries. So it, it's, wow, that's a that's a big, a big question mark. But when he's leaving, he's attacked by this like ram grizzly bear hybrid thing with like eight legs or something. Totally nuts, totally nuts. And he's finally saying he, he, Fights it off a little bit with his blasting rod, but he happens to soul gaze with it and, uh, and, and sees that it's actually human. And he sees like this past life, this dude being like crucified on the side of a mountain. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Really, really cool setup. But the beast recovers and it's about to whoop that ass. 
And that's when this old man shows up and tells Harry, hey, hold these. And holds it, hands him his glasses to hold his glasses. And he pulls out this sword. He starts fighting this thing off. And then another person shows up and he starts fighting him with the sword. And then our buddy Michael. Michael shows up and he actually ends the fight, you know, with, uh, with Amarachius and he kills the beast. And when the beast dies, it, uh, you know, it reverts to like a human form that just like disintegrates and it leaves behind just a silver coin that Michael will not let anyone touch. You know, he picks up like a cloth. Uh, he introduces the other guys. Uh, um, oh, God. Uh, Sonya. Sonya, like a, a Russian guy. And obviously the old man is Shiro. And uh, Shiro is a character that I've had many people tell me is one of the fan favorites. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like I'm supposed to like this guy right away. And it's not a problem because I do. I liked him right away. I mean... <laughs> The fact that he's told to hold his glasses while he goes and, you know, ninja assassins this thing is pretty, pretty awesome. But uh, he tells them they, they, they are the Knights of the Cross. And, uh, you know, they all have their big badass swords. And, you know, I love Amarachius. If you go back to the uh, the Great Peril review, how much I love Amarachius. I said I want Amarachius, like, mounted on my wall up there. Uh, but uh, he talks about these coins and says that this, this is just one and there are 29 more, which I immediately said, hmm. 30 silver coins. Sounds familiar if you're into biblical references at all. 30 pieces of silver to Judas Iscariot. Makes a lot of sense. So again, I'm liking all this stuff. A lot of people consider these things cliche. I'm liking it. I'm liking it quite a bit. And it's given me all the stuff I felt like I didn't get from Dan Brown books. And I hate always just bashing on Dan Brown. But it's one of those things where I can't believe I read them. I really just can't because it's, they, they just weren't they weren't good writing. Anyhow, uh, so later on at, at Harry's apartment, uh, the Archive shows up, and just, she's there to contract the fight between Harry and Ortega. And it's just a seven-year-old girl, and Harry's just trying to like get through to her, and like, what's your name? So like, she just keeps saying Archive. He's trying to find like some, some shred of humanity in her. He ends up just calling her Ivy, obviously short for Archive. Ivy, Ivy, you get it? It's Harry. This is just Harry doing Harry things, and it's what we love about him. Uh, but uh, the final hitch for the contract is that Harry needs a second, which is basically like someone to back you up in the fight in case it's needed. And uh, so he goes and he tries to uh, find uh, Michael, you know, because he wants Michael to be a second. And uh, instead, he he meets Molly. That's that's Michael's 14 year old daughter, and has some interesting conversations with her. Uh, I've already had it told to me that that uh, that Holly Molly, sorry Molly, becomes a very big character in this series. So I'm already interested in the dynamic between these two, and it really is just. It feels like I do if I'm talking to a teenager. I'm just like so out of touch with what they're into, and I just don't understand. And then when they try to talk about anything serious, I'm just like ah ah yeah. So uh, full on like dad moment there, even though I know Harry doesn't have you. That for me, it felt like a dad moment. What it's gonna be like trying to talk to my kids when they're teenagers, and I shudder at that thought. Uh, <laughs> But then he obviously he's ramrodded by Charity, who wants nothing to do with Harry whatsoever. Uh, and you know what? I, I can't get mad at Charity. I know a lot of people will say like, I hate, I hate Charity. She's such a bitch. And I'm like, yo! Every time Harry is around, her husband gets in trouble, almost gets killed. I understand it, man. I get it. Doesn't mean uh, I appreciate it per se, but I'm just saying I get it. I get why she's like that. We all have that one really good friend's spouse who can't stand you because they think you're a bad influence. Well, you know. Multiply that time a mi times a million. That's that's what you know, Harry. Because with Harry, it usually ends up when someone's going to interrupt dead. But uh, obviously, Michael's out of town, so he can't actually be uh, Harry's second. So Shiro offers to be his second. So really cool little bromance budding between these two, and, and I'm liking it quite a bit. Uh, there's also a plot in this book where Harry is just kind of tracking down the thieves that stole the shroud, and it's obviously part of the main narrative. It just I didn't find the thieves, or end up end up being just the thief because one dies. I didn't find her character very interesting, like at all. So I, I'm just really not going to even... I, I can show you that I could talk about this story without even bringing her up. And I know now that I'm saying that, she's probably going to show up like multiple times in the series because I said that. But in this book, I, I didn't really care about her at all. I felt like she was just there for the Shroud to find a way to get stolen and make its way to Marcone. I really feel like that's the only reason she was there. And to be another uh, beautiful woman that Harry can't stop looking at. Because, I mean, that's, Harry loves him some beautiful women, don't he? Um, anyhow, where was I? So Susan gives Harry, like, her dear John moment. And she says, you know, even though they're in love, they can't be together for the obvious reasons. So they agree it's time to part for good. And she says she's headed to South America after this whole ordeal is over to uh, to help other victims of the Red Court that are similar to her. So they have like a kind of like a refuge camp called a fellowship, which I think is going to be unpacked a lot more going forward. Uh, but Harry heads to McAnally's to sign the contract for the duel 
with Ortega. And we see that Ortega's second is Thomas Wraith from Grave Pearl. So it's good to see Thomas again. Uh, he is of the White Court. And uh, apparently all the other vampires do not like the White Court. So uh, if I missed it, maybe I did. Because like I said, you read these really quick. Uh, I don't understand why he would pick Thomas to be his second if no one likes them. Guess I might have missed that detail, but it's interesting, uh, especially since I felt like, you know, Thomas and Harry, you know, they worked their issues out, obviously, after, you know, it's his fault, really, what happened to Susan, but they ended up working together enough to where I feel like they're on the same page, uh, especially since uh, Thomas doesn't seem to like vampires either, you know, you know, he has one, but... You know, you always got to have that one good vampire with a soul, so to speak, going back to the Buffy thing there. But we find out Marcone obviously, is the one that is trying to get the Shroud off the thief. Uh, this is where we meet who is by far the best villain in this series to me. Uh, I've, I've liked a lot of the, you know, the one-offs in this, but they've all felt like one-offs. This feels like the first one that's going to be around for a while. I'm talking, of course, about Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, uh, he has this noose. For a necktie, which is revealed to be the rope that Judas Iscariot hung himself with, and it gives him invulnerability. You know, uh, so this dude is a badass. I mean, he has all the best lines in this book. You can't kill him. Uh, he he he's all business. He's just ruthless. And I said he feels. And guys, if you haven't caught it by now, I'm reading these books because to me they feel like Buffy or Angel, and so I'm going to keep making that reference a lot. Nicodemus feels like a really good big bad from a season of Buffy. I really could have seen him as being, you know, a Joss Whedon creation. I really, really like Nicodemus. And, and I'm glad that the way the, this book ends is kind of ambiguous what happened to him. So I, obviously I think that this is the first big bad I think that's going to live and be around for hopefully a while. Because I, I thought this guy was compelling as hell. I like him and all the, the Denarians quite a bit. So long story short, Harry now has the Shroud in his possession, but he has been captured by Nicodemus and the Denarians. And while he's a prisoner, Nicodemus makes a, uh, an ultimatum to Harry. He, he offers him one of the coins, and he says, you can either accept the coin and you know become one of my little little slaves here, or you can uh, or I can rip your throat out. You know, And he just treats it like it's nothing, like it's just something to do uh, on a shopping list. You know, just something I got to do this, like I'm on my errands. No compassion whatsoever. It's just it's just business, right? And again, it's, I mean, I think this guy's just great. He's a badass. I love it. I really feel like that's what this series has needed so far. It's kind of an overarching villain, more than just like Leah or something like that, or the looming Red Court War. I, I needed like an actual face for this, and I feel like Nicodemus is one of the good ones. And uh, again, if he doesn't show up again, then I feel like a fool right now. I'm just saying this is the first villain I've really, really liked. Uh, but uh, Shiro shows up and uh, fights off some people and tells Nicodemus, that uh, if he lets Harry go, he will take his place, to which Nicodemus agrees. And Harry's let go after Shiro. He gives him uh, Phytalachius. That's his so his holy sword. So uh, back at his place, him and Susan are trapped inside due to his wards until daybreak because you know, they're being chased. And uh, she's scared she's going to be attacking Harry because of her. You know she took so much, so many injuries at the at the you know trying to escape that she needs to heal. So she's got the bloodlust. She she wants to bite him. So. He ties her up, and long story short, they actually end up having, like, crazy bondage sex. So, hey, you go get it, Butcher. You do you, man. Uh, <laughs> it was interesting. It was interesting. I didn't expect that at all, but okay. Uh, hey, like I said, you do you, Butcher. Uh, but uh, Harry finally ends up heading to his duel with Ortega, which is actually taking place at Wrigley Field. I mean, how discreet. Uh, that, that wouldn't draw any attention at all. But, you know, while they're fighting... Ortega tells him, you know, he's going to, after after he kills Harry, he's going to kill everybody that he loves, and you know, this, obviously this turns the tie a little bit. Harry actually starts winning the fight, and Ortega proves that he's just a chicken shit, you know. And he pulls a gun on him, and uh, before he can shoot Harry, though, it's actually shot. He's actually shot, and uh, you know, vampires can be shot and, and, and be just fine. And then like this huge firefight begins, and all these red court vampires show up. And um, God, what was the guy's name? The guy that was with is Kincaid. I can't remember. The guy that's with the archive is actually like her protector. Uh, reveals that he was the his whole assignment was to take out Ortega. And you know he's like sniping. He's got like these shotguns that can kill vampires like instantly and stuff. Kind of made me think of Underworld. You know, remember that vampire series Underworld where they had like the light bullets. It's kind of what it made me think of. So uh, pretty interesting. But uh, you know Ortega gets away, uh, and and Ivy who is actually there to make sure it's a fair fight, uses, I can't remember what the relic is called, but basically she just burns all these vampires alive. And, uh, yeah, she was there to ensure that it was a fair fight, and it is what it is. So Ortega escapes, and Nicodemus, now he is actually 
intending to cast a plague on all of humanity, the same plague that they found on those, those, those bodies, I guess. And, uh, or, or, and uh, so he, Harry's off to stop him, has Murphy call in like a bomb threat for him to clear out the airport to get all the civilians out there. So like I said, Murphy's going to bat for Harry now, and I, and I really, really like that. But him, Michael, and Sonya, they make it to the chapel where Shiro has been tortured and only has moments left before he dies. Uh, he asks Harry to pass on his sword to the next bearer and says that Harry will know who it is when that time comes and really just gives him the like I, I you know the you know I it kind of reminded me of the stand where you know Harry's like you know I don't necessarily believe and, and sure basically gives him the he believes in you speech kind of thing it was good it's good stuff like I said the, the religious stuff in here which usually can feel forced or, or ham-fisted and things like this I actually felt like they fit and they fit really well and I really think that Butcher is just becoming a better writer as this series goes along I never thought there was anything wrong with his writing I just feel like he's landing emotional beats now that I didn't feel like he was able to land before. They actually were just kind of like, yeah, okay, that feels kind of corny. Uh, but I, I actually, this relationship with Harry and Shiro, I actually liked quite a bit. And I was actually upset to see him die. I like that. This is one of my favorite new secondary characters, like immediately. And I didn't expect him to die in this first book, especially how much of the fandom likes him. But I think that just is a testament to how great this book is. So uh, I was bummed. I was bummed. But uh, Harry then calls in an odd favor to Johnny Marcone. And they use his chopper to catch a train that Nicodemus is on. And they have this huge final train. Made me think of that really poor adaptation of Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Yeah. So, <laughs> again, this book was taking me out of, uh, of it just a little bit to think about other things in media. But in a good way. In a good way. I'm, I'm having fun. A ton of fun. So they have this huge fight. And then Michael takes a bullet shot straight through the chest and I'm like butcher you son of a bitch I couldn't believe it I was like did you really just kill off my favorite secondary character <laughs> and uh, uh yeah but uh Harry chokes Nicodemus using the noose they, because they can't get it off him so he starts choking him with him and then he falls off the train and Harry gets Michael's body and they jump into the river and then Marconi Marconi it's Marcone right it's just Marcone uh Marcone actually rescues them using the shroud so uh interesting uh if you want to take any kind of symbolism from that you can uh, but Harry recovers, finds out that Michael is okay. Uh, his knight armor had been fortified by Kevlar, which was actually made by Charity. Apparently she used to work in a motorcycle chop shop. So she made his armor for him. That's pretty cool. Um, but he gives him a letter from Shira that it was addressed like, you know, before any of this even started. And in it he tells Harry that he had a terminal illness, and that's why he took his place. Obviously, you know, he could make that one last sacrifice before he went. And, you know, gives words of encouragement to Harry. And it's, it's tear-jerk quality stuff. I really felt like it was well-written. And I said, this is the first one of those emotional beats that really hit home for me in these books. So uh, I don't know if I'm just becoming more attached to the characters by books in. Maybe. Maybe. I, like I said, I felt like I was invested right away. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, this one really, really had some emotional resonance with me. It was really, really well done. Uh, so we find out that Marconi has a shroud, and Harry decides to tell him and see what he's trying to do with him. And he follows him to a hospital where he goes in to see this Jane Doe that is in a vegetative state. And he moves up her blankets, and he puts the shroud on her, covers her back up, and then starts to pray. So we're like, what in the world is going on? And it turns out that uh, you know Harry confronts her, and after he gets Marconi, to Marcon I don't know why I keep saying Marconi, Marcone to calm down, uh, he, he basically tells him, you know, yes, this is... His daughter and, you know, Harry's like, you know that that's not going to work, right? And at this point, Harry, uh, Marcone says, you know what? At this point, I'm willing to try anything. So uh, Harry says he'll give him three days with the shroud. And if you know anything about Christian religion, you know that three days is rather significant with the shroud. And uh, Marcone finally does agree that he'll return it to the uh, to the, to the Vatican. And so the book ends, not the Vatican, uh, Father Fort Hill, Foot Hill? Anyway. Too many characters sometimes. Uh, but the book ends with Harry over at the Carpenter's Place seeing uh, his namesake, you know, little Harry Carpenter. And he's out there in the backyard with him, and a car drives by and throws one of those silver coins in the yard. And little Harry starts going for it. And Dresden, Harry Dresden, actually, like, stops him and, and grabs the coin. He actually touches it. And he takes it back to his house, and he buries it in concrete under the lab floor. Now, that seems like it'll be important later, huh? And that's kind of... Where we end, uh, I think it's where he's actually taking the pictures of Susan down at his apartment. So uh, if this is the exit for the Susan and Harry romance, I'm okay with it. 
I'm okay with it. Uh, I liked them together. I thought they were really good together. They had really good uh, chemistry, really good back and forth. I think Elaine is obviously going to play into something there down the road. But uh, like I said, uh, Harry doesn't seem to have a hard time uh, finding me- finding and meeting beautiful women. So uh, I think he'll be okay in that regard. But uh, if that is if that is the end of their arc, uh, I-, I feel like it's been really good. I do think Susan will show up. Uh, she's been in, if not every one of these books, I think four out of the five so far. So we'll see her again. Uh, I hope we see Nicodemus again, because like I said, I think he's been the best villain in the series, and I would definitely like more, for sure, definitely more of him. Obviously, I love any of these books that's got Michael in it. Uh, the, the two books that have had Michael are my favorite two books in the series now. Like I said, I feel like this is probably my favorite book out of all these now. Uh, I actually started Blood Rites, but I really am not that far into it, maybe like 50 pages, because uh, I've barely been wrapped up in uh, Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson. I was trying to read them at the same time. Now I just think uh, I'll finish that and then I'll then I'll really hit uh, this real good. But if you guys don't know the news, I actually found out that uh, I got approved for an ARC. That's an advanced reading copy for Peace Talks from the publisher. So uh, I feel like I'm going to have to actually you know put the gas down a little bit on this series. I was just doing two a month. I might have to move that to you know two one month and then three the next because I would like to actually be able to get to Peace Talks as soon as I'm able to get it. So uh, I might be ramping this series up a little bit. So if you guys are sticking with me for that, uh, <laughs> I had a lot of people tell me, you know, this is bullshit, Mike. You weren't into this series at all. You start reading it. Now you're going to get to read Peace Talks three months before I do? That's bullshit. <laughs> so uh, I-, I understand uh, how that can be frustrating to to some people. But uh, I'm very excited to do it. Definitely not a humble brag. I just I'm just excited because I've been trying to get... Uh, art copies of stuff for a while and publishers never even speak to me so hopefully this means that the channel is growing enough that I'm actually uh, being considered a reputable source at at one point so again you guys thank you so much for watching these Uh, you want to hit the comments please do and let's talk about uh, the first five books so uh, obviously guys if you haven't read the first five books I don't know what you're doing watching a spoiler video for book five but uh, please hit me in the comments let me know what you think up to this point but please don't mention anything after this yet because uh, I am still new to the series. I'm not that far into Blood Rites and I would like people to feel safe going into the comments if they're reading along with me and they've only been as far as I have. So uh, books one through five, spoilers okay. Books everything else, please don't, please don't, please don't. So, But please do hit the comments guys. Let me know what you think about this or did you like this book as much as me? Um, I feel like a lot of people still put Summer Night as their favorite up to this point but for me it wasn't close. This is